just see if I can share my screen. Um, and I'm going to put this in presentation view. So um, can you can Great. you see? The yeah, I can see the see the presentation. I can hear you just fine. So over to you. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Well, uh, first of all, thank you everyone for logging in over Zoom. Um, this is my first macro conference, so it's been exciting. Um, it's it's very rare for me to go to a conference where I want to go to everyone's talk just based off their titles, but um, this is kind of like heaven for me, I guess, because uh, I'm super into large scale uh, sort of research questions. Um, but I'm also honored to be um, the student plenary speaker today, and I'm just excited to really talk about what I've been doing for the past year during the pandemic uh, with some awesome co-authors. So before I start the talk, I just want to quickly comment and say that this is a project that's co-led by both myself and Doug Boer, who's a postdoctoral researcher at Yale University. And um, to start this topic or start this uh, talk, I want to talk about the main focus of this research project, which revolved uh, around body size. And so the question of why animals are bigger or smaller has been asked for a really long time, and it still remains a, a relevant question to this day. Um, we know that ecologies and physiologies of organisms are often influenced or tied to body size. And so understanding how, and more importantly, why size varies across the planet is probably very critical to our understanding of biodiversity in general. And as such, there's been numerous studies done on the effects of extrinsic drivers such as climate or latitude on size. And oftentimes these studies mainly center, center around vertebrates. And there are often many hypotheses that drive these studies that revolve around uh, thermoregulatory properties of organisms or the ability of an organism to forage for resources. And so here I have a list of all these different hypotheses and the list goes on and on. Um, in the case of our project, uh, we selected several extrinsic drivers that were associated with different hypotheses. Um, the first of which was utilizing a moisture index in our analyses. Uh, the moisture index, or you can call it an aridity index, is tied to the water conservation hypothesis, uh, where surface area to volume ratio is often smaller in larger uh, organisms, which reduces water loss. So we would expect to see larger ants, in this case, in drier areas uh, than in moisture uh, or wetter areas. Um, the second driver that we were interested in assessing was the coefficient of variation of MPP, which ties to the dietary breadth hypothesis. Now, this hypothesis posits that areas that have higher resource heterogeneity or more spatial patchiness in resources would promote an opportunistic diet, which is often associated to be uh, more or less seen in larger organisms. And then the third driver of our interest was temperature range, which is tied to the starvation hypothesis. And this hypothesis posits that in seasonal environments, larger organisms can hold uh, larger fat stores. So they can take advantage of those resources when their normal food resource uh, wanes throughout um, environmentally harsh uh, periods. And then the final driver of our interest was uh, suitable plant growth days or plant growth days in general. Um, and this is tied to the growing season hypothesis, which posits that um, areas that have more consistent plant growth days uh, would likely yield organisms that are larger in general because these organisms have more time to take advantage of those resources. However, um, we also wanted to consider the potential effects of intrinsic traits and drivers on size. And so um, intrinsic traits in this case are biological attributes. By, uh, and an example of this could be a dietary role. Um, depending on the environment and resource availability, uh, dietary roles may need to shift, which can ultimately result in a shift in size. And these intrinsic traits themselves have shown to uh, have latitudinal trends. So this is an example from birds uh, in Kissling et al. 2012. And so it's not really crazy to think or question whether or not size is impacted by both these extrinsic well-studied drivers and now these intrinsic drivers as well. And this sets up the conceptual framework for this project uh, where we look to see if there's this mediation effect of dietary role uh, 
between uh, an extrinsic driver, be it latitude, climate, um, and size. And so um, to actually pursue these sort of questions, we needed to have an organism to work with. And of course, uh, big surprise, we used ants. Um, we chose ants because number one, they're very diverse. They're a very diverse invertebrate group. And per perhaps more importantly, they're taxonomically tractable, which is critical when you know we're dealing with over thousands of species. Um, on top of that, they hold a variety of dietary roles in their natural histories. You can have ants that uh, garden uh, fungus, you can have ants that are specialist predators, army ants, um, the list goes on and it's really quite fascinating. Um, the second reason is that they're globally distributed, which of course is very important when we wanna start talking about biodiversity at global scales. And then perhaps last but not least, um, they've been known to be very key ecological components uh, in many ecosystems around the world. And so the objectives of this study were twofold. The first one was to assess whether or not size is impacted by extrinsic drivers at global scales. And then the second uh, part of this was to basically answer the question of whether or not dietary breadth influences body size in the context of these extrinsic drivers. So whether or not we see this mediation effect. And if we did see this mediation effect, uh, we were curious about the directionality of these effect sizes. And so in order to pursue these objectives, we had to collect a lot of data uh, from different sources. Um, for the spatial data, what we did was we got ant spatial data from Gabby, which is the Global Ants Biodiversity and Informatics Database. Um, I want to say right here that um, we only use native ants in their native ranges, so we didn't really consider uh, non-native ants in this analysis or project. Um, and for size, what we used was head width, uh, a morphometric that's often used as a proxy for body size in ants because those two metrics are really tightly correlated. Um, and we were able to get head widths for about 1,100 or 11,000 species, which represents over two thirds of the global ant uh, fauna. And then finally, for our abiotic data, the extrinsic drivers such as climate, uh, we managed to grab that from multiple sources. Perhaps more interestingly uh, is the dietary role variable. So dietary roles were assigned at the genus level for about 167 genera spanning over 8,600 species. And to be more specific, uh, Brian Fisher, a co-author on this project was the person who assigned these roles using his extensive collection of specimen data uh, from around the planet. And Brian has worked with ants for, for decades and he's really just this authority figure and knows these ants better than anyone else. So. Um, Usually what he thinks is an omnivore is most likely true, um, but also the definitions of these different dietary rules were based off of a paper by Soziak and Barden in 2020 in functional ecology. And, you know, it's, it's a great paper. Um, I just want to give it a quick shout out. Like you don't have to be an amp person uh, to appreciate this. I think uh, they combine a lot of cool techniques and ideas. Um, but in general, we assigned eight different dietary rules uh, based off this table here. So we have anything from omnivores to different types of predators to uh, seed harvester ants. And to analyze the data, what we did was uh, we analyzed the data at the assemblage scale. So we utilized hexagonal bins for assemblage scale analyses. And within each of these hex bins, as I'll call them, we calculated the average size of the ant assemblage there. We also calculated the omnivore percentage or the number of ants relative to the total number of ants that were omnivores. And we also calculated a uh, mean abiotic conditions. Um, there was this special exception where of course with uh, NPP, we also calculated the coefficient of variation of NPP within each of these hex bins. And to analyze the data, what we utilized were uh, path models using the piecewise SEM package. And this is a really cool package because it allows for different model types and different sort of uh, uh, correlation structures to be embedded in your path model. Um, but I'll get into more of that later on. Um, but of course, when we're analyzing things in general and even at the global scale, we always come up with, uh, we always run into issues. And one of the issues we first faced was that wide ranging species can drive any patterns we were to see. And this would be, 
a case of spatial pseudo replication. So to address this, what we did was we utilized a subsampling routine where we allowed a single species to contribute only once via random sampling. So an example of this would be that if I had species A and species A was in 10 hex bins, uh, I randomly selected just one of those 10 to represent species A's contribution to the global species pool. And we did this for every species and we did this 500 times. So that resulted in 500 subsample data sets that we were able to run path models for each one of those. So in total, we were running 500 path models because of these different uh, data sets. Another issue uh, that we faced was spatial autocorrelation. And this is kind of where the beauty of uh, piecewise SEM comes into play. Um, we're able to utilize uh, spatial GLS regressions that incorporated uh, spatial correlation structures that uh, not only accounted for distances between hex bins, but also accounted for the curvature of the earth. So we weren't using Euclidean distances, uh, we were using great circle distances. And uh, I thought that was really cool and really helpful to use, uh, especially considering that spatial autocorrelation is usually apparent in this sort of data. And then the actual format of the path model was pretty simple. So across all path models, we always had two extrinsic drivers impacting size directly, but we also had that mediation effect, uh, the, the second objective of this project. Uh, so that mediation effect went through omnivore percentage. And then finally, to account for species diversity biasing the number of omnivores within an assemblage, we included a species richness effect on omnivore percentage. Um, in total, we ran four different model types. Uh, and these model types were based off of uh, hypotheses that were previously mentioned, and um, they were run 500 times each. So the first model type we used was called the NPP model, which utilizes uh, extrinsic drivers that would best explain the available NPP in a given area. So these variables would be moisture and suitable plant growth days. The second model was the growth model. And this, this model reflects extrinsic drivers that are, that are important in the growth of the actual ant. So this would be the spatial patchiness of resource availability. So that would be the coefficient of variation of MPP and also suitable plant growth days. Um, the third model we used was called or labeled the physiology model. And this model reflects variables that are important to an insect's physiology. Uh, these would be moisture levels and temperature range. Uh, and we can, we can tie this to the insect physiology because as moisture levels uh, vary, that can impact the desiccation uh, of different insects. Uh, and as well as temperature range, temperature range can reflect environmental harshness that could also impact the physiology of an insect. And then the final model that we uh, developed and synthesized essentially was the stability model. And this stability model reflects uh, the environmental stability of a given area. So we utilize once again, the space, uh, the spatial patchiness of resources and um, temperature range. And so I kind of wanted to show just the basic raw data first. So this is a, a really cool global map showing size at the assemblage scale in ants across the world. Um, and right off the bat, you see that in northern latitudes, um, you do have larger ant assemblages. Uh, in terms of size. And then as you move down to the mid latitudes, this actually decreases and we see this sort of gradient here. And that's especially apparent in North and South America. Um, but we also see that sort of a gradient. In, um, position across latitude with a stream plot. Uh, we see even more interesting patterns. So this stream plot shows latitude on the y-axis and species richness on the x-axis. And when you look at the northern latitudes right over here, most of the species richness uh, is comprised of mostly omnivorous ants. Um, as we move down to the mid-latitudes, the tropics, of course, species richness increases as expected, but omnivores start to make up less and less of the overall species richness. Um, and so this could indicate that areas in the tropics are experiencing, um, or areas in the tropics have more ants that perhaps are more specialized. 
And when we focus more on omnivore percentage in general across the planet and map that out, we start to see very clear patterns here where um, we see in northern latitudes um, that assemblages are mostly dominated by omnivorous ants. And the gradient of this decreasing omnivory into the tropics is most apparent in North and South America. But there are also signs of this in uh, Africa and Asia as well. So we've seen these different uh, potential correlations and patterns just based off of these maps. Um, and to make sense of all of this, uh, we have to kind of dive into the path models and the results of these path models. And um, before I do that, I kind of want to orient the audience to uh, how to read uh, these results. Um, I think reading results from a path model in general are complicated, let alone reading results from over 500 path models. Um, so I quickly want to orient everyone to the axes here. So the y axis represents the standardized effect size of a variable on omnivore percentage. And then the x axis represents a standardized effect size on body size. And of course, because these are standardized effect sizes, they're directly comparable to one another. And I also want to preface by saying that if you remember, we had four different model types that were run 500 times each. So for a given variable such as temperature range, you're looking at perhaps up to 1,000 coefficients to show. Um, but I want to start off with the main result here, the, the kind of the, the big takeaway, which is the effect of omnivore percentage on size. Uh, this is a histogram showing the distribution of these effect sizes across all four models. And one thing that you'll note, first of all, is that there is a positive effect size in general. There's very little overlap with zero. That also signifies that, uh, in general, across these models, the effect size is significant. Um, but more importantly, what this histogram is showing us is that um, as omnivore percentage increases within an assemblage, the size of that assemblage also increases. So this is pretty key because it helps explain this mediation effect, and it also helps explain the other variables that I'll be talking about. Um, so the next variable I want to talk about uh, is our first extrinsic variable, which is temperature range. So you'll notice that temperature range is in a density plot form. Uh, that's because temperature range had effects on omnivore percentage and size in two of the four models that we ran. And uh, so therefore, to show these two histograms in two-dimensional space, we use a density plot. And to interpret this, once again, it's relatively simple. Um, first of all, uh, temperature range effects on size. The median or mean effect size based off this plot is around 0 0.2, 0 0.23. Um, and so we see this positive effect of as temperature range increases, body size increases. Um, when we do this with the y-axis, um, where our response is omnivore percentage, you'll notice that the slope uh, increases a bit, mostly because the mean or the median effect size of uh, temperature range on omnivore percentage uh, is slightly higher than 0 0.2. And so um, what does this all mean, right? Um, well, with temperature range, what we utilized was we utilized temperature range to assess the starvation hypothesis. And what we're seeing from our models is that in areas with more variable temperatures, you do have more omnivores. And omnivores tend to lead to this increase in uh, assemblage scale size. So that mediation effect is very apparent and very significant. Uh, perhaps more interestingly, temperature range also has this direct effect that's not mediated uh, through omnivore percentage. And that direct effect is uh, on size. So temperature range in many ways has two significant effects, uh, one through mediation and one through just direct effects. Um, the second variable I want to talk about is the coefficient of variation of MPP or the spatial patchiness of resources. Um, you'll notice in this case that there's a lot of overlap with zero in this variable, uh, hinting that perhaps these effect sizes are rather weak when considering significance. Um, but I will say that uh, the effect sizes of coefficient of, of, of this variable on omnivore percentage was actually marginally significant. And so, we utilize the coefficient of variation of MPP to assess the dietary breadth hypothesis. And what we're seeing from these results is that in areas with higher resource heterogeneity, there are indeed more omnivores. And once again, going back to that mediation effect, 
that is apparent across all model types, uh, the more omnivores you have in an assemblage, the larger your assemblage is. And so we see evidence here that the dietary breadth hypothesis is supported in our study system. Um, the second to last driver was the moisture index. And you'll notice right off the bat that there are two density plots in this case. And this reflects the two different models that were utilized uh, with moisture index. Um, moisture index was used to assess the water conservation hypothesis. And based off these results, it seems like it really depends on the model, which model we use. Um, in one model, we see that in wetter areas, you have less omnivores and that could impact size as well. But in general, um, we're gonna chalk this up to inconclusive evidence at least for now for the water conservation hypothesis. And then the final model uh, or the final extrinsic driver was plant growth days. And this variable is relatively easy to understand. Uh, first things first, it does overlap heavily with zero on its effect on size. So plant growth days doesn't really have a direct impact on size but it does have a strong effect on omnivore percentage. And we use plant growth days to assess the length of growing season hypothesis. And I wanna remind everyone that the length of growing season hypothesis says that areas with more consistent plant growth uh, should have larger sized organisms. Um, but in this case, we see evidence that refutes that. In fact, we see that in areas with more consistent plant growth, you actually have less omnivores and going back to this mediation effect, if you have less omnivores, your assemblage scale size is smaller. So here we see evidence that ends up refuting one of the hypotheses. Um, but I kind of want to bring it back to this mediation effect. Um, if there's anything you take away from today's talk, uh, I hope it's this. Um, this I think is really cool because um, we're kind of getting to this stage where we're trying to understand why these size gradients are appearing ra rather than do these size gradients appear and let's, uh, let's think of a reason why we see correlations between temperature range and size. And um, I want to end this talk on a quote uh, from Mike Kaspari. He, he wrote a paper in 2005 assessing Bergman's rule uh, in ants. And what he said at the, at the end of his paper was really interesting. He said, um, by testing multiple hypotheses, incorporating multiple causal factors for multiple size components, perhaps we can move beyond the question of how prevalent is Bergman's rule to the much more interesting how and why do size gradients arise. And at least for the invertebrate uh, side of things, I, I think this is really exciting and we're moving in that direction. I think this has been shown in vertebrates, especially with birds, but with invertebrates, I, I think this is the first time. Um, but with that, uh, I wanna first acknowledge a lot of people. Uh, this was a pretty data dense uh, project. Uh, so I wanna first of all, thank my co-author and co-lead Doug. Doug, uh, Doug and I have been uh, chatting over Zoom at least twice a week for the past year. So we've gotten to know each other really well, um, as well as my co-authors, Brian, Evan, Benoit, Maisha, Andrea, and of course, Walter Yetz. And um, with that, I guess um, I'll take any questions on Slack. Um, if, if you wanna follow uh, updates on this project as well as other global studies, you know, feel free to follow us on Twitter uh, where we post most of that stuff. So, yeah. Amazing work. Thank you, Leo. Virtual, virtual round of applause there. I Thank think you. I can see a lot of the uh... The clapping, the, the virtual clapping hands appearing there. It was amazing. Thank you. I really enjoyed it, not least because of how you very kindly walked us through your results. That was really nicely done. Uh, so thank you very much. I can already see there are some questions rolling in um, on Slack. So I'm really just going to go down them in the order in which they arrived. So Manuela got in there first uh, saying, could you build one path model with all environmental variables to better understand if moisture index matters or not? Or does that get too messy? Um, we 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 have okay. So like that's a great question. Um, I think that's kind of been up for debate in our research group. Um, one person wants to go that way, the other person doesn't. Um, I think it's it, for me um, personally speaking, we kind of set this up as an AIC framework based approach initially. So those four models are like we do rank them by AIC, and so 
in in some cases, yes, we we could put all the predictors in there. I haven't tried personally. Um, it, I think it would help understand all these effect sizes a lot better. But also, like a priori, you know, like you, we meant to use a model ranking framework, and so we have that. Um, should we start, you know, I, I guess building more models at this point? I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think it's still up to, for debate, but I think that's a really good suggestion as well. Great, thanks, Leah. And um, I just noticed that Manuela commented and appended her comment saying, excellent talk, saying she should have started with that. So thank you, Manuela. Um, okay. Another question here from um, Alex Slavenko. Um, I'm just going down the list, but do keep the questions coming in. We've got, we've got another nine minutes or so for questions, so, so do add them on. Um, so Alex Slavenko, excellent talk, really interesting work. Did you try running the analyses with a smaller scale grid? And which cast events were the head size measurements taken from? Do you think the result would differ if you use different casts? Yeah, so uh, to answer the first part of the question, um, we chose, we, we did go a little bit smaller with the scale initially, but the problem is just the quality of the global data is not that great. Uh, we're not using range maps by any means. So as we get smaller in scale, uh, sampling biases start to take over. And so like, it's actually interesting when you use a smaller scale, North America ends up becoming the most diverse you know, continent while South America ends up being very uh, small in diversity. Um, and then in terms of the cast, um, what we did was we chose the maximum head width um, across cast so that so we would be basically choosing uh, soldiers for uh, for example the fungus gardening ants um, we we're not sure whether or not the results would change too much um, I think we're still kind of working through that um, but it is on our radar for sure um, and we were thinking about running analyses on different casts and putting that in the supplementary material but yeah awesome thank you um, so the next question is from from Tom Bishop, a uh, great talk, Leo, really enjoyed it. Fascinating results. How representative of actual ant communities or assemblages do you think the Atlas data you used is? And he says he's just interested to know about the Atlas data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so at, at this point, that, that was also another point of concern for us. Because, um, you know, I, I remember, uh, if I remember correctly, the scale of each of those hex bins was approximately 600,000 square kilometers. That's about the size of Texas. So, you know, we're really pushing it with this word of assemblage or community. Um, so to be honest, I, I, I think I, if we had better data, we would go at a smaller scale to represent a community or an assemblage more effectively, uh, because in some cases, these hex bins can overlap into completely different ecoregions or biogeographical realms. Um, but I, I guess I'll, I'll chalk it up to just the, the lack of data quality for now, um, but yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a fairly ubiquitous problem from anyone, anyone watching your talk as well. So I'm sure, yeah, everyone, everyone can, uh, can appreciate that. Uh, so from Shan Huang, uh, do you see any size based sampling effect? Um, perhaps that's not so much of a problem at your spatial scale, but um, they're just curious about that. So those size based sampling effects. No, uh, not really. But to be honest, we also didn't really look for those sort of biases, but we kind of chalked it up, like I said, to assuming that at these scales, we probably would not see it. Yeah, sure, no worries. Um, and then we have a question from Adam, and then the question seems to be drying up after Adam, but we do still have a good five minutes. So feel free to add on a couple more questions, anyone, if you've uh, got a burning question in your mind. So Adam Elgar says, cool work. I'm, I'd, I'd be interested in the direction of causality between omnivory and body size. Can you be confident that environment influences omnivory, which influences body size? Or could it be that environments favor larger body size, which results in more omnivory? So it's a question about causality. And the uh, direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I guess one way we could do this on a technical aspect would be to switch the path model uh, and then compare it uh, to one another. But no, um, we, we're pretty confident with the current mediation effect we're seeing, mostly because uh, one of the key emphasis, emphases of this study was to really tie it back to natural history. So Doug and I have done a lot of community ecology with ants, and we've do dove into the literature on natural history. And we really wanted to make sure that we were tying this to, okay, what exactly does an ant do on the ground? Like what sort of environmental conditions would promote omnivory? And it's surprising because when you start really digging into the literature, you look into like little natural history notes or 
work by, you know, maybe perhaps less well-known scientists who have worked on ants, you start to see that there, there are environmental effects at the local scale that ultimately influence um, uh, the body, uh, uh, the, the resource uh, foraging ability of, of ants. So I'm trying to think of an example right now. You kind of put me on the spot. So <laughs> give me one second. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think there was this one experiment by Mike Kaspari where essentially he, uh, he bred different fire ant colonies. And mind you, this is one species, but you know, this is still pretty interesting. He bred different fire ant colonies and he put them in different conditions, uh, different environmental harshness, mostly based off of temperature. And what he was seeing was in more environmental, environmentally harsh temperatures, these colonies were starting to forage from a more wider variety of uh, resource types. But in colonies that had you know, the optimum temperature, they were mostly going for a specific protein uh, protein diet. So um, I guess that's, those are the few examples that we're hoping to tie this all into, but yeah. Sure. Great answer. Um, it does say in Slack that several people are typing questions and, but they're not appearing yet. So if you could perhaps keep an eye, oh, one just popped up. Sorry, maybe we can fit in, fit in one more than in that case. Um, so John Clark has said, are there any interesting clade specific patterns worthy of note? Um, for yes. example. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's written more, but if you've got an answer to just that bit, then go for it. Um, yeah, okay. So um, in terms of clades, so uh, within Formicinae, so the, the two the two biggest clades, of course, that we had, the subfamilies we had were Myrmicines and Formicines. And it's interesting because Formicine ants uh, actually showcase this increasing head size across uh, increasing absolute latitude very clearly. Uh, but the Myrmicine ants, they they don't really have that strong trend. They they have a slight trend. Um, I wish I, I had I had this graph. I was thinking about putting it in the slides, but I forgot. But um, yeah, uh, essentially, um, yeah, with with one set subfamily, the form Formicinae, we do see strong uh, size trends across latitude. But with the other biggest subfamily, Myrmicinae, um, that trend is not as strong. So, I mean, it kind of leads to possible future projects where we look at a more macro evolutionary uh, perspective on this. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, and then the, a couple of other questions have come in as well. So hopefully you can you can take a look at those on Slack and, and reply yeah. um, on there just in the interest of time. I think it's, it's good to move on, but thank you. That was a fantastic student plenary. Um, imagine a big round of applause in your head. <laughs>